Hey guys, so this one's going to be pretty introductory. It's for people that don't know Godot and don't know programming. If you're pretty proficient with either one, I would just skip this one. Uh, it's going to be introductory stuff, documentation, print statements, kind of general purpose code organization, nothing too fancy. But if you're doing tutorials every day, if you're getting mad at error messages, if somebody told you to read the documentation and you just really weren't sure how, then this will be the one for you. And the goal is to get you to a point where you can confidently work. The goal is to not lose velocity waiting four hours for some guy on Reddit to tell you what to do. It's to have the tools and the ability to just keep working when you can't find a solution, right? You just keep working. So we're gonna talk about the documentation first. But even before that, that something I have to clear up because I see this with new programmers a lot. There is not a bug with the engine. There is not a bug with the compiler. The computer is most likely 99.99% .99 chance doing what you told it to and you just told it to do something weird. If you get an error, like you attempted to call a function on object nil, that's you, that's not them. They didn't delete your object. You deleted your object, or you sent a weird reference, or something like that. You shouldn't be getting mad at errors or warnings. You should be happy, you should be grateful, you should be like, oh man, they've helped me identify something that was not working how I expected. And you know it's not working how you expected because you didn't mean to send an empty object and then call a function on it, right? So it's kind of like an alert more than a warning or an error. It says, hey, look at this code and fix it because this is not what you meant to do. And I know that's not what you meant to do. Use the compiler. Don't fight it. So that's one. That's the first thing. Second thing, we're going to read documentation. So everything in Godot, all the scripts are going to extend some built-in base class. So like my base mobile is what we're going to use for an example. It extends kinematic body. And in turn, my player and my NPCs, they extend base mobile. So the way inheritance works is that base mobile is a kinematic body. It will have access to everything that kinematic body has access to. So move and slide, my base mobile can move and slide. My player can move and slide because it inherits down the chain. Now, my kinematic body cannot do any of the things that my base mobile can, right? Like, it can't on register. Kinematic body just can't do it because it's higher up in the chain. So that's important to understand. Everything's going to extend something. And if it's a base built-in class, there's a page for documentation for it. To get to that page, we can do control and click on the word, or we can do F1 and search it. It's also online documentation, which tends to have a little bit more writing and less hard factual truth. What we're after here is the hard factual truth. Because I can tell you how move and slide works. I can tell you how to get rid of move and slide warnings. I can even tell you how to hide move and slide warnings so that you never ever get return value issues again. But wouldn't you rather know how move and slide works so that you can use it however you want? And you can understand what you might be missing out on by just hiding warnings. So we're going to do control click. We're going to go to kinematic body. Okay, so this is a documentation page. And you'll get something very similar if we go to kinematic body here. You'll get these annoying highlights on the website. But if you just delete this portion of the URL, it will fuck off. So very similar, right? We're going to use the in-editor stuff because I find it more convenient. So it inherits physics body, which inherits collision object, which inherits spatial. So a kinematic body, in the same way that a player is a base mobile, a kinematic body is a spatial. So it has access to all the properties and methods that a spatial has. That's why you can set your global transform, right? All that sort of thing is because a kinematic body is a spatial. A spatial is not a kinematic body, but a kinematic body is a spatial. So we're going to go down. These descriptions are useful. Read them. They will help you understand. Properties. These are variables that you have access to. So over here's the type. Bools and a float in this case. So like axis lock motion x. 
is a bool. True or false? What happens if I set it to true? Well, let's click it and find out. Locks the body's x-axis movement. I didn't know I had access to that, but now I do. It's great. The meat and potatoes of most classes is going to be the methods. Um, the properties are important to know, but the methods are what you're going to end up using most of the time. So we've got return types. If it is void, it does something, right? So it either returns something or it does something. Bad functions do both. Good functions do one or the other. So for example, get floor normal returns a vector three. So let's click it. Returns the surface normal of the floor at the last collision point. Only valid after calling move and slide or move and slide with snap or when is on floor returns true. This is relevant. This is the sort of information you want to get. This is the truth of the class. Is on floor. People have tons of issues with is on floor. So let's go look at it for realsies. Returns true if the body collided with the floor on the last call of move and slide or move and slide with snap. Otherwise returns false. A big problem that I see a lot is people are like, my is on floor is just toggling back and forth. Well, has it collided with the floor on the last call of move and slide? Or did it do it several calls ago because you haven't moved? Because you only move if you're not on the floor. I've seen that bug so much. Is on wall. You have to continuously move against the wall or this is going to return false. And that's the sort of thing you learn in the documentation. So going back to the methods, we're going to look at move and slide. We all know it returns a vector 3, and we all know that because we get that annoying warning that says, hey, this returns a value and you didn't use it. So we're going to look at the arguments of move and slide. Linear velocity is a vector 3. You've probably used this. This is generally how you move your character. Up direction is a vector 3. Usually this is vector 3 dot up. Doesn't have to be though, and that's important. You can make the up direction whatever you want it to be by changing this vector 3. Stop on slope. Some people will have used this, but you can set it to true or false. If you want to slide down mountains, set it here. Max slides. Most people leave this at 4. 4 is fine, but you could do more or less depending on your actual use case. Floor max angle is <laughs> important, but nobody talks about it. Infinite inertia is important, but nobody talks about it. So let's go to the move and slide function and see what all of these actually do. If we look at like max floor max angle is the maximum angle in radians. Now that's another thing that you get with the documentation. I could tell you all the arguments for move and slide. And I could tell you, oh, that's just uh, the angle that you can go up. But if you don't know it's in radians, you're going to spend 10 hours trying to find the right degrees and wondering why 45 is not 45 degrees. When you come in here and you know it's radians, well, that's a fucking game changer. And that's why we read the truth of the documentation instead of just watching tutorials. Tutorials are great, and we're going to talk about them in a bit, but we'll stick with the docs for now. So we get down here, and it says returns the linear velocity vector rotated and or scaled if a slide collision occurred. So the return value of move and slide returns the linear velocity, which is the number that you fed into it initially, rotated and or scaled if a slide collision occurred so that you can slide. So you can slide. To get detailed information about collisions that occurred, use get slide collision. Right, that, that is relevant information to almost every single person watching the video. Um, you may use it, you may not, but now you at least know what it is. So that if you discard it, you know what you're discarding. You know that it's not breaking anything. Um, it's, it's important. So that is kind of like the gist of reading the docs, but I want to go a little further to explain like just how crazy it is to not read the documentation. So every single day, dozens of people on the internet struggle with an issue with vector threes. Now, if you've only done 2D, 
Vector 3 is just a vector 2 with an extra number. That's it. But we can, we can find the truth of that, right? I just summarized it, and we'll see if that's true. The only properties it has are x, y, and z. And they're floats. They're not integers. They're floats. Could be relevant for your use case. Now, what methods does it have? There's a lot of returns here. Why is a vector 3 with only three numbers returning so much stuff? Because it's different versions of itself that are useful for different things. The one that I like to use as an example is rotated. So vector 3 dot rotated takes in an axis. Oh, didn't mean to click. And a radians. A radians, not a degrees. So it rotates this vector around given axis by phi radians. The axis must be a normalized vector. So what might be a use case for this? Now that we have this new enhanced knowledge of vector threes, well, when we go to our base mobile, I actually think it's in movement. Ugh. Embarrassing. Embarrassing. But the important thing is when we get to, nope, not there either. Is that more embarrassing? I don't know where my code lives. Literally no idea where it's at. Fantastic. Where would it be? Being player controls. Yes, so get wasd cam. Uh, this gets WAS and D keys, and it, wrote, it stores them in a vector three, and then it rotates them based on the camera's facing. Uh, its rotation around the y-axis. So we return a vector 3 from w, a, s, and d, and it's just kind of like a shortcut thing. It could be a vector 2, but I just use vector 3 because it's easier for me. But yeah, so get wasd cam just gets this, and then it normalizes it, rotates it using dot rotated around up, by the rotation y of the camera, and then it returns that rotated. That sort of thing would be a huge pain in the ass to write yourself. But because we know that Vector3 has this rotated function, we, we could save a lot of time. Right, so anytime you're going to extend a class or use a type, Come in here and just kind of see what you can and can't do with it. A lot of stuff is already built in. We've got absolute vector threes. We've got max axis, which tells us what the highest number axis is. We've got min axis, which tells us what the lowest number axis is. Uh, we can move toward, right? Which is kind of like uh, inter interpolation, I think. We can do linear interpolate. You know, like all of this really useful stuff we can do on every vector three in the engine. So that's how you use the docs, right? Like, let's say we, we want to do some string manipulation. So what do we do? We go to the string class and we see what can a string do. I don't really super understand this section. I think it's just making strings from things, but I don't actually know. Uh, but then we get down here into the methods, and we can check if it begins with stuff. We'll get return to bool, a true or a false. We can capitalize it. We can dedent it. Dedent, what does that do? Returns a copy of the string with indentation, leading tabs and spaces removed. See also indent, to add indentation. Like These are all things that you can just do with strings out of the box. You can trim prefixes. You can, you know, put it back into an int if it's all right, you know, if it's formatted properly. You can, there's some stuff you can do with file names. Let me see if base name is here. Get base name. If the string is a valid file path, returns the full file path without the extension. Doing these things by hand on your own is reinventing the wheel. And you will do this until you tear your hair out if you don't read the documentation take the time to at least like just read the method names so you kind of have like an idea of what could be done 
And when you start to think like, oh man, I wish this thing could do this thing. Check if it does that thing first already, right? Like what is strip edges? Returns a copy of the string stripped of any non-printable character, including tabulation spaces and line breaks at the beginning and the end. Useful for me? No, useful for somebody. So I think I've harped on about documentation enough that I want to talk about uh, code organization a little bit. So let's get back into it with base mobile as an example. Uh, we're going to talk about code organization and my code organization is not perfect or stellar. This is my real code in my real world project. It is not sterilized for a tutorial, so it's going to be ugly, but it should help you out if you're new. So one of the things that new people tend to do is write these big long functions that do many different things in a weird order and they only work if they're in that order and so it's very fragile, very easy to break, very hard to figure out what it's actually doing and why. They tend to compensate for this with comments. Uh, comments, comments are a failure, let's be honest. So. A lot of people will tell you to comment your code. That's because they don't trust your code to be readable. That, that's the long and short of it. And you can write readable code. I believe in you. So the way that you write readable code is that you compose functions, which means you have a function made up of other smaller functions that each do one thing. So I said earlier that good functions either calculate and return a value or they do something. If a function does both, it becomes unpredictable. It, it generally, you cannot say on the name what it's going to do, or you have very long names. Very long names are fine as long as they're accurate. So let's scroll through base mobile a little bit and we'll talk about it. You see that my ready function has no logic. It just calls register and connect weapon signals. Both of these are verbs. They are proactive. They say like a command, like this is what it does. If there was a button that said register or connect weapon signals and you clicked it, you would know that it's gonna go do some stuff. So let's see what, let's say connect weapon signals, what it actually does. And we use that same command earlier as control and left click on the name to just jump to it. Um, another way to browse your functions really easily this little function thing here, if you click this button, it will alphabetize them. And you're not scrolling through here anymore trying to figure out what, what. You're just looking for the name. Alphabetized. Fantastic. Get used to using this. If you get used to using this, it does not matter how big your file is. You can get to the function you care about. So, connect weapon signals. Small function, what is it actually doing? Uh, we discard the values because connect returns an error value. I just don't care. I just don't. But we're basically just connecting to a signal from armature, connecting it to ourselves and an on signal function to give us access to those signals. That's it. That's all connect weapon signals does. It does something is the important thing. It's a verb. So then we go down to our physics process. We have a little bit of logic. If we've got viewers and we are the master, then we're going to do our stuff, which is fine. This doesn't need to be a function. Could be, but it doesn't need to be. Uh, process state machine, process effects, commit move, update. You have no idea how my code works, and I bet you have some idea of what's happening here. If I were to ask you, are effects applied the our movement effects applied the frame that they come in or the frame after you would be able to say that effects come before movement and so they are applied first and I could help you fix a bug someday it's very easy to read this function okay so one other benefit of composing functions in this way and hiding everything all the logic behind a function is that you can rewrite the back end of it without having to actually update any of the function calls. So right now we are calling connect weapon signals. And as long as that's what we want to do, we can change this implementation. 
We could get rid of the armature completely, put the weapon directly on the base mold, and just connect to it here. We could do a million different things. We can do anything we want. As long as this function is still called, we just do it here and nothing breaks because everything that needs to call connect weapon signals is calling it by function name instead of doing these things individually. And that is probably one of the biggest benefits of splitting everything out into functions is that you can just break it down and change it and you don't have to worry about going up the chain. And you'll see that in an example like process effects, right? Let's go to it, control and click you'll see that my buff list is doing the actual processing. My base mobile doesn't actually know anything about this. He just knows that buff list knows how to process it. So he's going to go there. Um, I don't have that link right now. So we're going to have to open it the long way from the scene. My buff list. Okay. So when we get down to process, this function could do anything. I could change entirely how this works and the base mobile would not care. He would just keep on calling buff list to process because it's a function. And because I didn't try to do all this in one big function, instead I composed that function of smaller functions. It splits out the responsibility in such a way that nobody's gonna break everything if you change it on the very end of the chain. If you change it in the middle, you're gonna get fucked. If you do it on the very end, you'll be okay. So like here we do i.execute host. This is awful code, don't do this. But it basically just takes all the buffs in the list and runs through their effects. That's it. But I could change that. I could make this do anything. I could get rid of the buff list and I could replace it with just buffs directly on the base mobile. And I could do all that right here. And I would not have to change the actual loop that happens every frame. So you want to compose your functions of smaller functions that either calculate and return a value or are void and do something. Void functions that don't do anything literally don't do anything because they don't return a value. Like it's just dead code. If you see that, and I've seen it before, I've done it before, you're doing something weird and you need to clean up your code. Uh, functions that return a value and do something like that's super sketchy you don't want to do that a lot there are reasons right like connect returns a value it returns an error code right which is a return but you want to use it sparingly you do not want to give things two responsibilities you want to have them do one thing and do it really well i think that's the end of my my code organization spiel really like the way that I've organized my project is I've got the mobile, the base mobile as kind of an interface for these lower objects, the armature, the buff list, the controls, the state machine. And that's why my physics loop is just like really short, really small, right? Cause each of these just calls out to tell that thing to do its thing. Um, not the best code. You really probably shouldn't do it that way. And my physics loop does lag, but having this as an interface is totally acceptable. It's totally fine. All right. We are closing in on the end of the video. There's just two more things I want to talk about that apparently no Godot newbie ever has figured out. So we're going to talk about it to save you some pain. Um, first is going to be print statements. So we're going to come in here and we're going to do print. Print is fantastic. Print, yeah, see, control and click, converts one or more arguments of any type to string in the best way possible and prints them to the console. Right? So if we print our position, right? And this is just a 3D position. Don't worry about it. When our base mobile is ready, Right, we're gonna get this printed down here in the console. So if you have a crash, a bug, if it says that object doesn't exist and you tried to call a function on it, you wanna put a print statement right above the crash and you wanna run it again. And that print statement, you put in there whatever variable failed, 
right? So if it says null object, you walk backwards through the code with print statements until you see where you're losing it. And it's kind of like debugging 101 is print statements. This is for like lazy, bad coding idiots. Use print statements instead of like a profiler or a debugger. You, you just walk backwards through it over and over running it until you see where the issue is. So like here we can do, let's say print net stats dot is master. If we wanted to confirm that this is coming out true. And if we wanted to confirm that it was getting to this point in the code, we could do print uh, donkeys, right? And we'll run it. And we'll go and we will see that it printed true and donkeys. And it just kind of confirms like what the value is. Now you don't want to go wild with print statements. You generally want to clear them out before you commit your code because a ton of print statements will lag eventually. There will be a performance hit. Um, I do leave some print statements in, as you can see, like events is ready, network's ready, data's ready. It kind of reminds me of the order that things happen in, and that's just useful for me. Um, I have my help command run, so I know what commands I have access to. Also, just a reminder, that's chat commands. I don't actually know what this acknowledged is, and that's why you want to remove your print statements. I have literally no idea where this is coming from, and it's going to take me forever to find it. Okay, so that's print statements. You just print the variables as you need them. Very useful for tracking down where exactly your code is breaking. The other one is the remote viewer. So we're going to run the game. And we're going to go online. And we're going to go over here. And in the editor, there's this remote button. Click the remote button. This is the currently running world viewport, basically. So we come in here and we can find our player. Here's our player. And some things you can kind of mess with and some things that doesn't work so good. So let's say we go minus 50, right? That was the wrong. So we just go 50. I'm way over the ground, right? You can kind of mess with things here. But the important thing is that you can read your variables directly, right? So we can go into my inventory and we can go into my equipment dictionary. And let's see if we can make this bigger. And we can see what I have equipped in my main hand, which is a katana. I can get all the stats for that katana. Now, if I were to equip a club, right, what we do is we go back to it. And we go back to my main hand, and it's still a katana. Why is it still a katana? Do we have to reselect the guy? Inventory, main hand, club. Okay, yeah, so we just needed to update it by reselecting it. But it's really, really useful if you are having issues with something working unexpectedly or if you think something's not loading correctly, you go to this remote tab up here instead of local, and then you can check everything, right? Like. On my data persistence, I can check what my current save data is, right? I can see that as far as equipped, only my club is saved. Uh, these are my kind of default sets. My config, I can check. This web hook is old. Don't spam it, bro. <laughs> but uh, in my chat color, all that sort of stuff, you can see what your data is in the remote viewer. It's very useful. So that combined with print statements, combined with reading the documentation, you're gonna solve 99% of your problems. And if you can't, go to the Reddit, post on the Godot Reddit. People like to answer questions there. It makes them feel smart without making them feel douchey like Stack Overflow guys. So I think I've talked long enough. This is going to be a very long video. Um, if you have additional questions, post comments, hit me up on Discord, all that sort of thing. Uh, the Lucky Crab on Reddit, feel free to hit me there, whatever you're most comfortable with. If this helped you, please let me know. Uh, if there's something you'd like me to cover in the future, let me know. But for now, I think that's going to do it.
I hope you fix all your bugs and write all your code perfectly the first time. Have a great day, guys. Uh, okay, so. Completely lost my train of thought.